Hey everyone, welcome back. Ready to really get inside people's heads a bit. Today, we're diving into human behavior with this applied behavior analysis excerpt. Should get interesting. Definitely a different way of looking at why we do the things we do, that's for sure. So to kick things off, how does this source actually define behavior? It's one of those terms everyone thinks they get, but this seems way more precise. Right. It's not just our everyday understanding. Like imagine reaching for a snack, say, uh, a bag of peanuts. Most folks would just call that getting a snack. Makes sense so far. But see, behavior analysts, they'd zero in on how you're interacting with everything around you. The reaching, the grabbing, peeling that bag open. That's the behavior they're after, those observable actions. So not just being hungry, but the exact steps you take to deal with it. That's a cool distinction. It is. And it means things that just happen to you, not something you do. Those are out. Like getting caught in a sudden downpour, that's not behavior, but how you react running for cover, now that is. Okay, now it's clicking. The source also talks about response versus response class. What's the difference there? Think of it like this. Each time you open that bag of peanuts, that's a response, one instance, but the response class is broader. It's all the ways you could get those peanuts. Yeah. But the outcome, you eating them, is the same. Okay, this is where it gets really interesting for me. So. How does knowing about response class actually help someone trying to, like, change how they act? Because often we're aiming for a bigger change, not just the tiny details, right? Like, if you're trying to eat healthier, swapping peanuts for baby carrots, that's the goal. However those carrots end up in your hand doesn't really matter. Right. It's the big picture, not sweating the small stuff. And speaking of big picture, yeah. the source talks a lot about the role of environment. And they mean everything when they say that. Not just like, are you indoors or outdoors, but every little thing surrounding you. The temperature, what you see and hear, people around you, even how your clothes feel, all part of the environment. Wow, that's a lot to consider. It's amazing how much we tune out without realizing it. Exactly. We're flooded with these environmental cues constantly, what behavior analysts call stimuli. And what they're really interested in is how changes in those stimuli change behavior. Can you give an example of that? Sure. Imagine a student taking a math test. The test itself is a stimulus, right? So it's the ticking clock, the other students in the room. And then there are the consequences of interacting with all of that. Like the relief of finishing a tough problem or a teacher giving you encouragement. Exactly. Those are perfect examples of antecedents and consequences, which together shape how that student acts in that specific situation. Understanding those is key to getting why we do what we do. It's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it, all those little environmental things nudging us in one direction or another. Totally. And then there's how our behavior actually works on top of that, which is its own thing. The source breaks it down into two main types, respondent and operant. Okay, so break those down for me. What's yeah. the difference? Respondent behavior, that's all about reflexes, the automatic stuff we don't have to learn. Like, picture going to the doctor, right? They shine that light in your eye, your pupil shrinks. Don't got to think about it. Just happens. Oh, or the knee jerk thing they do. That too. Yeah. So basically our built in wiring. Exactly. But here's where it gets wild. These automatic reactions, we can actually link them to new triggers through experience. Like, remember Pavlov's dogs? That whole experiment might have learned about it. Yeah, kind of rings a bell, but refresh my memory. So Pavlov, he'd ring a bell, totally neutral sound, right before giving his dogs food. Now, food makes dogs drool naturally. But after pairing the bell with the food enough times, the dog started drooling at just the bell itself, no food needed. Learned a new association. Oh, yeah. It's like our brains are wired to connect things like that, huh? Totally. But those connections aren't permanent either. What's learned can be unlearned. If that bell keeps ringing and ringing and no food ever shows up, eventually the dogs, they'd stop drooling at it. That's called extinction. So like, even our learned reflexes fade if they don't work anymore. Makes sense. Okay, so that's respondent, the more automatic stuff. What about operant behavior then? What makes that different? Operant behavior is all about consequences, the stuff that happens because of what we do. It's how we figure out how to get the good stuff, avoid the bad by how we interact with the world. Trial and error, you know? So it's how we get better, more effective over time at getting what we want. You got it. And this is where it's super relevant to like, anyone trying to understand why people act the way they do because operant behavior it's defined by the effect it has not just what it looks like Ooh, okay i need an example i think 
What do you mean by that? Sure. Picture this. You're thirsty. Want a glass of water? You could ask for one directly, right? I will. Or point at a picture, maybe even do a whole dance to get someone's attention. All different behaviors, but they could all have the same outcome. You get your water. Ah. So it's about the end result, not the specific method <laughs> that defines it. Exactly. Super important difference when figuring out people's motivations. The source even compares this whole upright selection thing to Darwin's natural selection, actually. Whoa, really? That's a cool connection. How so? Just like in nature, right? Traits that help something survive, reproduce, those get passed down. Well, behaviors that get us good results, those are the ones that stick around too, become part of how we operate. Love that analogy. So the, the stuff that works for us in our lives sticks around just like helpful traits in nature. Exactly. It's all about adapting to the environment we're in, figuratively or literally. So we've got these consequences shaping what we do, but how does that work mechanically? Tell me about the nuts and bolts of it. Well, the source talks about two big ways those consequences shape us. Reinforcement and punishment. And those are words I feel like everyone thinks they get. But there are probably nuances here most people miss. Oh, 100%. Let's start with reinforcement, meaning simply it makes a behavior more likely to happen again. Comes in two flavors, positive and negative. And this is where I think people get tripped up. Because positive doesn't equal good necessarily. And negative isn't some evil twin. Right. You got it. It's all about what's being added in or taken away. Think of a baby playing with a mobile. When they swat at it, it moves, plays music. That's positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Like something's added, the fun stuff. So they're going to swap more. Okay, makes sense. So negative reinforcement in that scenario would be? Let's say the baby starts fussing because there's a loud noise, right? Uh. Picking them up makes the noise stop. It's relief for everyone. That's negative reinforcement. Parents are more likely to pick them up next time because that got rid of something unpleasant. Ah, so it's about the result. Removing something bad. Not whether the action itself is good or bad. Exactly. And both those types of reinforcement, crazy powerful in shaping us, from tiny habits to major life decisions. Man, I'm seeing reinforcement everywhere now. Okay, so that's one side. What about punishment then? How's that fit in? Punishment's the flip side. Makes a behavior less likely to happen again. And just like reinforcement, it can be positive or negative. Adding something to decrease the behavior or taking something away. So giving a time out, that'd be negative punishment because you're removing the kid from something fun. Spot on. And giving them extra chores, that'd be positive punishment. Again, focus is on the outcome, less of the unwanted behavior, not whether we think it's good or bad. This is making me realize how much my actions, everyone's really, are shaped by these consequences all day long, whether we notice it or not. Whole new way of looking at things. That's what's so cool about this field, gives us a framework to get ourselves and the world on a deeper level. So we've got these reinforcements, punishments, all that, shaping how we act. Yeah. But it's not always simple, right? Like our source mentioned something called discriminative stimuli. Mm -hmm. Kind of adds another layer to it all. Yeah, real life's messy, never just one-to-one. These discriminative stimuli, they're like cues in our environment telling us which behaviors are going to get us what results at that moment. Help us make sense of it all. So it's like they're giving us hints about what will happen if we act a certain way based on what's around us. Exactly. Think about it. Your phone rings. That sound, that's a discriminative stimulus. It's telling you, hey, if you pick up, chances are you're going to have a conversation. And ignoring it probably means a missed call. Maybe someone wondering why you didn't answer. Exactly. It's all those past experiences with certain cues and what happened afterward that shapes how we react next time. We're wired to pay attention to the stuff that's meant good things or bad things before. Makes sense. Our brains are like constantly trying to guess the best move based on what we've already been through. Spot on. And this goes back to what the source calls the three-term contingency, which is kind of a pillar in behavior analysis. Right, right. You mentioned that earlier, the antecedent behavior consequence combo. Yeah. That's the one. It's like the recipe for how to understand why people do stuff. Antecedent. That's whatever comes before the action. Behavior is the action itself. And consequence, well, that's what happens because of it. Yeah. Put them all together, you get a much clearer picture of someone's actions. Okay, so how does that actually help someone change their behavior, though, if they want to break a bad habit or something? It's about spotting the patterns. Say you want to stop late night snacking, right? Well, if you can figure out the antecedents, maybe boredom, stress at night, you can start changing those. 
or you look at the consequences. Maybe it's just that temporary enjoyment of the snack and find healthier ways to give yourself that reward. So it's not about just willpower. It's about getting the whole picture, all those factors playing a part, right? 100%. And that's what's cool about behavior analysis, honestly. It's like it gives you actual tools to make changes that last, not just hoping for the best. I like the sound of that. <laughs> but our source does point out, you know, people are messy, doesn't always line up perfectly like yeah, these yeah. examples, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Got to keep in mind, there's always more going on under the surface. Like the source talks about response chains where one action kind of leads you down this whole path. Start with, I'll just tidy this drawer. Next thing you know, you're reorganizing your whole closet. Been there, oh my gosh, way too often. Yeah. And there's the whole verbal behavior thing too, right? Mm. What we tell ourselves, the conversations in our heads, all that plays a role. Verbal behavior, that's a whole other rabbit hole. Super interesting, though. Reminds us our thoughts are part of our environment, too. Influencing us, just like stuff we see and hear. We can literally psych ourselves up or talk ourselves out of things just with our words. So true. And like the cherry on top, the source even mentions individual differences. What works for one person might totally flop for someone else. Yep. Everyone's got their own history, their genetics, what's going on in their lives right now, all different. So this one-size-fits-all approach to behavior, never going to work long term. So where does that leave us then? If it's all so nuanced, how do we even begin to make sense of human behavior, let alone like actually change it for the better? Million-dollar question right there. I think the biggest takeaway is, even if we don't have all the answers, the more we get these principles, the antecedents, the behaviors, the consequences, everything around us influencing things, the better we are at making good choices, you know, for ourselves and others. That's a good way of putting it. Don't need to be a scientist to benefit from knowing this stuff. Exactly. Even just being aware of it all, noticing your own patterns more, huge difference already. This deep dive has definitely given me a lot to think about. Catching myself noticing these antecedents, consequences everywhere now like a whole new way of seeing things. That's awesome. It really does make things richer, doesn't it? When you start viewing the world through this lens. It really does. So before we wrap up, any final thoughts for our listeners out there as they go out and navigate the craziness that is human behavior? Be curious. Keep your eyes open. And be patient, both with yourself and with everyone else. Changing behavior, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Every little bit of understanding helps. Could not have said it better myself. Mm. Huge thanks for joining me on this deep dive. It's been fascinating. And to everyone listening, until next time, keep those minds curious. Mm.